Dr. Nunley's here from Evangel University. He also teaches at the Theological Seminary. Dr. Nunley takes our trips with us to Israel. Dr. Nunley, but when he mentions uh, ancient Hebrew, he speaks and reads ancient Hebrew. He also can speak uh, modern Hebrew. The guy's a genius. He's an archaeological stud. He's traveled the, the world. Uh, he's pretty amazing, and now he's going to be humble before you as he comes. Come on up here, Dr. Wave Nunley. Come on, give him a good welcome. Can't go that high. Good morning, New Hope. It is so good to be back home. We live five and a half hours from here in Springfield, but we're kind of like a, an old shoe that the dog keeps dragging back home, throw it away, and it keeps coming back. But I am so thankful for the opportunity to spend time with you guys a couple of times a year. Appreciate Pastor Jeff, uh, uh, the rest of the pastoral staff, Pastor Weaver, Pastor Austin, who's not able to be with us uh, today, and all the other guys, Brett, everybody. They're a wonderful team to work with, and you guys are just an incredible group to be able to share with. And so um, I'm grateful. My heart is full. Um, this is like the best, it's like Christmas, Thanksgiving, July the 4th, and my birthday all rolled into one. Yeah, great to be with you all. If you guys could uh, put the uh, slides up on the screen. Um, when I'm in Israel, and I am there often, between two and six groups every year, uh, probably as I head toward retirement, we'll be doing even more and not less. But... Um, uh, after we're into the, uh, the, the trip about three or four days, there's a question that, that comes up with almost every group. We have gone by this time to multiple, multiple places every day, and we're reading the Bible in light of the physical reality that we're encountering in the land of Israel. And so, uh, after looking at archaeology, after looking at geography, after looking at all of the uh, kinds of artifacts in museums and that sort of thing, studying the Bible on location, in context, on site, people will inevitably ask the question, well, you know, I, as I've been here and I've let my roots of my faith grow down deep in this fertile soil of reality, of, of, of tangible, verifiable, you know, objective stuff that you can see that corroborates or confirms the testimony of Scripture. Well, I feel like I'm cheating a little bit, like there's something that's not exactly right on, 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 along this line because I thought that faith was supposed to be something ethereal, something that was still out in the future, something that could not be seen. And so I wanted to bring this message to you. I wrote an article, you can advance it to the next slide. Um, faith and evidence. Is it possible that they're just constantly enemies of one another or do they cooperate and are they actually allies? Does one support the other? Do we have to choose between the one or the other or can we have the full meal deal? Just like with the food. I like the full meal deal. Don't you like to get a good deal? I think I'm going to try. I'm going to see if what I can do to give you a twofer this morning. Next slide. Feel free to, we'll be posting this at the um, website, the, the church's website. So you can go to that, uh, that link and read the, the full article. But I just wanted to share with you kind of a summation of it this morning. In the scriptures, um, this is often when this subject comes up and we're studying on site, people will, will cite Matthew 18, Hebrews 11, and Romans 8 in asking that question, are, are we not like some kind of way cheapening our faith or doing something we shouldn't be doing or engaged in some learning activity process or whatever that, 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 that maybe lowers the bar? I'd like to address that this morning. Matthew 18, Jesus 
calls a little child and puts the child in the midst of the people he's teaching and he says, unless you become converted and become like a child, then you can't enter the kingdom. So does that mean simplistic in our thinking? Does that mean less educated than we should be about the things in the world that we have access to? Does it, does it mean that our faith should remain in some kind of a... Um, a, uh, a suspended state of childlikeness. That's certainly where we come to Jesus, but is, is that where we're supposed to remain? Next text. And then Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus with the child, the famous picture. Next. In Hebrews 11, faith is the assurance of things that are hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So when we do have objective reality in front of us, is there some kind of a problem with that? We have some sort of existential problem uh, between that which we're supposed to believe and that which can actually be seen with our eyes. Also, in Romans chapter 8, for in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one also hope for what he sees. These are questions, passages that are in people's minds as we go from place to place and see the Bible's message verified over and over in lots of different ways. So let's respond first to those three passages, Matthew 18, Hebrews 11, and Romans 8. Next. In Matthew 18, verse 4, which comes right after verse 3, I'm sure you probably did the math on that already pass the first test. Jesus says, he continues to talk about this child that he's placed in the middle of them, and he tells you exactly, as the Bible typically does, it clarifies itself. That's what we mean by the phrase, Scripture interprets Scripture. If you'll continue reading, the Bible will clarify exactly what it's talking about the overwhelming majority of times. So what is it that Jesus is trying to get at when he places a child in the midst of people and says, you've got to become like this to enter the kingdom. He's not referring to childlikeness. He's not referring to simplicity. He's referring to whoever then humbles, humbles himself as this child. He's the greatest in the kingdom. He's referring to childlike humility and not those other things. Similarly with Hebrews chapter 11. Next. When, he's, when it says in Hebrews 11 that it's the evidence of things not seen, he, he continues through the whole passage. All these died in this biblical faith, this biblical trust in God without receiving the promises, but seeing them, uh, but having seen them and welcomed them from a distance, confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. These guys, people like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon, uh, and others, they are looking at the promise of God, but they're holding on right where they are. They see it from afar, but they're hanging on, waiting for the fulfillment of that promise. They are living in a context of faith even where they are. The reality is that things that are hoped for absolutely have not yet been realized because they're still being hoped for. Look at Romans 8. In Romans 8, Paul says, if we hope for what we don't see, we per with perseverance we wait for it eagerly. All of these, these two passages are not talking about the full meal deal of faith. They're talking about one little component, one little aspect, one piece of the pie of what biblical faith actually is. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to go on a bit of a journey and look at the nature of biblical faith. Next slide. Biblical faith, the basis of it is evidence. It's grounded and rooted in reality. That's the nature of biblical faith. We are placing our trust in God. Faith is placing your complete trust in God. We're looking for this trust in God that we have now to continue in the future. But this faith that we have in God right now is not based on some sort of big uh, cosmic gamble. It's, it, it's not pie in the sky by and by. It's not faith that, hoping against hope that we're right. 
You know, the, there was a, a journalist that interviewed uh, Elvis Presley uh, before he died, and the journalist said, I, I noticed that around your neck are uh, pendants, one with the Islamic crescent, one with the Star of David, one with the Catholic crucifix, and the other with the empty Protestant cross. He said, what, what's up with that? And he goes, well, I don't want to miss heaven on a technicality. No, it's... It, our faith is a little bit more than some big gamble. It's a little bit more than some big gamble. It's also a little bit different than what we get in other, fa other faith communities. I remember when I was living in Israel, it was 1983, and I was asked if I would be interested in participating in a group of with a group of students to go to Mount Sinai on a bus. It was going to be very cheap, and I went, yeah, I'll, I'll go for that price. I want to be, I want to have, say that I have gone to and, and, and experienced Mount Sinai. And so uh, come to find out it was a bus that was full of 37 Mormon students and three Mormon elders and me. <laughs> and so one of the ways that it was so cheap was that instead of staying in a hotel halfway to Mount Sinai, we camped out on the beach of the, of the Red Sea. Uh, and so right before we all bedded down and went to sleep for the night, sleeping right there on the sand, uh, a Mormon, el one of the, one of the uh, Mormon elders waded out about knee deep into the uh, water of the Red Sea, and he gave us a little evening devotional, kind of a vesper service of sorts. And he took the opportunity because we actually were there. He said, now I'm told that on the other side of the Red Sea from where we are, there's an oasis. And at that oasis, that are, there are really large palm trees. According to the Book of Mormon, uh, when our spiritual forefathers migrated to that spot, they hewed those palm trees down, lashed them together, made gigantic rafts, and there migrated to the Americas. And he said, now that is an exceptional story in the Book of Mormon because it's the only touch point with any kind of observable, tangible, scientific reality um, in the entire book. And because of that, the Mormon faith is superior to the Orthodox traditional Christian faith because they have evidence for what they believe and we don't have any evidence for what we believe. And I thought, wait a minute, I, if you don't stop talking, my head's going to explode here. Um, but the, the point is this, I ask myself after that, but how many Christians believe that same way about their faith? That, that real biblical faith it can't have any basis in evidence, any basis in reality, and the ta and the ba on the base any basis on tangible, verifiable, objective stuff. And I think that that is where much of the body of Christ is stuck on this matter of faith. So that's why I want to look at the fact that there are multiple aspects or characteristics, facets to this thing that we call faith or placing our trust in God. So let's do that. Moses at the burning bush. We're going to look at one example from the Old Testament, one example from the New Testament. Fair enough? Um, when Moses is at the burning bush, he encounters God and God speaks to him and it appears like it's for the first time. And this is what God says. By the way, this is interestingly without plans uh, because they didn't know what I was going to teach and I didn't know what they were going to sing. We sang that song, He's the Great I Am. Take a look at this passage in Exodus chapter 3. Moses said to God, Behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me. So they might say to me, What is his name? What is his name? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And like, okay, well, that and $5 is going to get you Starbucks, right? The world does that mean? What in the world? I am who I am. So notice here, like we saw with Hebrews 11, like we saw with, with Matthew 18, as we saw with Romans chapter 8, you continue reading, it's, it kind of clarifies exactly what's being talked about there. All communication in, in the world of, of, of human inter, uh, interaction is, is exactly like that. It's about context. You've got to have 
context. Context clarifies the, how a certain word or phrase or even sentence, what it's, how it functions in a larger chunk of information or communication. So the next part of this verse reads, so furthermore, you know, kind of God doubles down on this. He's going to go and make another pass at it to make sure that Moses understands exactly what he's saying. And he's saying, say to the sons of Israel, it's the same message, tell them this. Now he's saying, tell them this. Tell them that the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name and this is my memorial name to all generations. This is what I am that I am means, guys. He's telling you what I am that I am means. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Put the two together and this is what you get. The God who always was and now is always will be the same. The God that your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob trusted and he never let them down. He always fulfilled his promise. He always came through when they needed guidance, when they needed protection, when they needed provision. What he's saying is the God that's calling on you to come out of Egypt is a God who can fulfill his promise. He said he was going to deliver. He's going to deliver. Why is that? Because he always has delivered. He's always come through. He's the God who is true to his promise. He's the God who can be trusted. He is therefore trustworthy. He's worthy of our trust because he's earned it the old-fashioned way. He's worthy of our trust because he's always kept his word. If he's calling you out of Egypt... He's saying he's going to deliver you. You better believe he's going to deliver you. So that's the kind of God that Moses introduces back into the life of the people of Israel. The God who delivers, the God who protects, the God who provides. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's exactly what this text is saying. So is he appealing then here is his argument, you can trust him to deliver you now because he's always done it in the past. Well, that's a faith based on the past. Yes? Yeah. Next slide. Let's look at another passage, this time from the New Testament side of our Bible. This is a picture of the empty tomb. Yes? We are a faith of the empty tomb. Yes? All right. Watch what the text, the scripture says about the resurrection of Jesus. In the book of Acts, it says that Jesus had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles. And to these apostles, he presented himself alive after his suffering with many convincing proofs. Oh, okay, well then, I guess our faith, written out in Scripture by these same apostles, I guess it was proven to them that Jesus raised from the dead. It wasn't just some kind of some kind of, mind, kind of mind over matter or some kind of a mental trick that they're playing on themselves. This text says that he showed up face to face with them, proving that he had been raised from the dead with many, you can go ahead and say it with me if you like, many convincing proofs. So then is, is our faith in Jesus based on historical reality, verifiable reality, observed appearances post-resurrection. Survey says, yeah, that's what this text is saying. So we're getting this God of reality, God of history, um, God of just think back on the way that I've been all along and that's going to inform you how I will be today and tomorrow kind of approach whether it's Old Testament Moses at the burning bush or New Testament empty tomb and Jesus appearances to the apostles it's the same stuff God is alive living working keeping his word, verifiable, historical reality in both sides of our canon, Old and New Testaments. Next text. So faith then, interestingly, is not one-dimensional, monofaceted. You know, it's, it, it's, it's very diverse and multifaceted, variegated. It has past, 
aspects to it. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the God of the, of, of the cross and of the burial and of the empty tomb. These are past realities, right? But it, he's also the God of the present. He's not just a God who lives in libraries and historical um, works of the past. He's a God who's alive and living today as well. Tell them I am that I am sent you. So he's a God for today, but he's not just, Paul says it like this, if for this life we have, only for this life we've hoped in him, we're all men to be most pitied. There is a future reality in God as well. If this is all there is, it's almost like we've all died and gone to hell. Because that's a lot, a lot of times, example, the murders in the Pittsburgh synagogue yesterday morning. There's a lot of that that goes on in this life. And I've got news for you. Jesus has not come back and you got left. He hasn't come back yet. You didn't get left. And there's something even better than what we're living today. If you're living a fulfilled life, thank God for that. But that's not, you've not reached the final reality either. So whether you're going through the valley of the shadow of death or you're living on the pinnacle of the mountaintop experience with God, God's promise to you is, you know what? It only gets better. So let's take a look at these three aspects of faith, past, present, and future. First of all, past tense. In 1 Corinthians, we're going back to this business of the basics of Christianity. The foundation, the basis is this. I make known to you the gospel that I preached, which you received in which you stand, which you are also saved if you hold fast the word that I preached to you, lest you believed in vain. But I'm preaching, to, to, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, primary foundational basic importance that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. Real quick pop quiz. Our, the basis of our faith, is it present tense, future tense, or past tense? What is Paul saying here? I delivered to you as of foundational importance that what? Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. Is that a current event or is that a past tense event? Past tense event. So our faith then is based on a past tense event. Is that what God was telling Moses at the burning bush? I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's saying God has acted in the past in ways that you can now trust him in the future, in the present and the future. Yes, I'm the God of the past. I have a track record. I have a dossier, I have a portfolio, I have a resume that has touch points with reality, historical reality where I've promised and I've came through. I promised and I came through. I took care of Abraham, I took care of Isaac, I took care of Jacob, and now that's why you can trust me to take care of you and yours. I am the God of the past. Not just the God of the past, but I'm a God who can be trusted now and in the future because of the past. It's not just a jump ball. It's not, the jury's not out on everything. It's not, well, I'm just hoping like Elvis did that I choose the right pendant, you know. This is not multiple choice. This is a God who has called you to walk with him, who has verified, who has demonstrated that he is a God who is worthy of your trust. He is trustworthy, all right? So, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, but he's not done. Next. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to, and then he gives a big long list of, I'm giving you the evidence for Jesus' bodily resurrection from the dead. I'm telling you, I'm giving you specific names and specific instances. Some of these instances in which multiple people were involved. They didn't all have the same hallucination. They're all experiencing a reality. He appeared to them, as Acts 1-3 says, with many convincing proofs. Here, Thomas, put your hand in my side. Put your fingers in the wounds in my hands and see how real this thing is. 
God's not going to leave himself without a witness, without a testimony, and he's, he does that still in our lives. If these people who actually walked with him for three, three and a half years needed that kind of convincing proof, then we need it too, and it's available to us. It is available to us. We're not like all the other world religions with a hope and a prayer. God is the God of history. God is the God of reality. God is the God of verifiable truth. And that's the way he rolls. People who have been to Israel, right here in your own congregation, if you don't know about this stuff, seek them out. Ask them. Tell me some stuff you saw. Tell me what this did with your faith, with your relationship with Jesus. Tell me what this, what this did to your trust level. And they will tell you it was in the land of the Bible that faith became sight. It's in the land of the Bible that's got this rich soil of all of this verifiable evidence that my roots grew down deep. And I came to trust in God before I trusted him. I came to trust in him more. I came to trust him at a depth and a level that I'd never dreamed that I would because I invested in myself and God grew me. He strengthened me. It doesn't weaken faith to see, to see truth, to see evidence, to see things that are externally verifiable, uh, uh, the objective reality. It doesn't hurt faith. It strengthens faith. So we're looking at the past tense of faith, and that is all... The, the resurrection of Jesus, it's, it's just all over the place with that. Many convincing proofs. Dozens and dozens, hundreds of people witnessed this resurrected Jesus, and that is the foundation of our faith. So it's not going to change. If that's the beginning of it, if that's the basis of it, then the whole thing should be shot through with that kind of evidential faith. Next. Present tense. Our faith is not just a past tense event. Yes, once upon a time, and they all lived happily ever after. It's a current reality. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved. It's a present tense reality. As much as there are those who are in the present tense perishing, there, there are those of us who are in the present tense. We are in the process of a salvation experience. And I recognize that, yes, it has to start somewhere. And there's sometimes a crisis event. Maybe it's at a youth camp. Maybe it's at a crusade. Maybe it's at an altar in a regular church service or whatever, where you come to a point where you give your life to Jesus. But my question is this. Is that when you're done? Is that the end of it? Is that, is that all that there is? I, I remember in um, 1970, what? Uh, 9, 1980, something like that. I was working for the telephone company in Vicksburg, Mississippi, and I was working on under the hood of a car with a, a mechanic named Larry. And I said, Larry, we'd gotten to know each other pretty well. I said, Larry, tell me, where do you stand with Jesus? And Larry said, well, I'll tell you what, Wave. He said, when I was 12 years old, this is a grown man. He said, when I was 12 years old, um, I, I went down to an altar one night and I prayed a prayer and I cried a cry and I signed a card. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm good to go for the duration. And I went, you know what, Larry, you're in just like huge trouble because it's not about a past tense event exclusively. Yes, it starts there, but it better be a present reality or we're all in trouble, you know you included. And so, um, yes, it's to those who are being saved. We are currently being saved. We are engaged in a process of being changed, as Paul says in the book of Romans, from one degree of glory to another until we're in the image of Christ. And we're not all there yet. So it has a past tense beginning. It has a current reality, but it, we're moving forward. This is not static. God is still at work in us. Next text, future tense, 1 Peter chapter 1. This is a beautiful passage. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again. Notice that past tense reality there. Past tense, to be born again to a living hope. There's a present reality, for living hope through the resurrection, but it's based on something that happened in the past, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, to obtain an inheritance. Now we're talking about the future. You see how he's got all three wrapped up into one? 
to obtain, obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled. It'll never fade away. It's reserved in heaven for you. So he's talking future tense. Who are protected by a, the power of God through a faith, through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed, salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. So this current situation we're in now is not all there is. And what Father Abraham, Father Isaac, and Father Jacob, what the prophet Moses, uh, what these guys that experienced the, the presence of God in the resurrected Jesus experience, even they haven't gotten the full download. There's still a f glorious future to come, and this is not all there is. Isn't that neat? Isn't it cool to know that God has got our past? He's got our present, but he's got this future that's, that awaits us. That's, it's not static, and it's ever developing. It's going from glory to glory, and it's just going to be so much fun, you don't have enough money to pay for it. Past, present, and future. That's the nature of our faith. So those passages that we looked at earlier, the Matthew chapter 18, that had a context. The, the, the Hebrews chapter 11, that had a context. And it was saying, that we're, just, we're dealing with this futuristic aspect of faith. That's what Hebrews 11 is dealing. That which is hoped for is not seen. Same thing with the Romans 8 passage. Because what's seen is not, is not the future. It's not hope, is it? No, it's, it's laid up for the... So those passages, Hebrews 11, Romans 8, talking about the futuristic, yet to be seen, yet to be experienced aspect of faith. The basis of that faith, though, is that God has acted in human history. What an amazing thing. And it's demonstrable. It's observable. It's tangible. It's palpable. It's real. It's reality. Next text. So biblical faith, it's not just, relate, just uh, uh, relegated to one or the other. It has all of these aspects, past, present, and future. And it's trust in God for the present and future based on his faithful acts in the past. Not just based on a wish and a prayer, hoping against hope. Well, flip a coin. Maybe he's going to be faithful, maybe he's not. God has demonstrated that he is worthy of our trust by his pa past track record of faithfulness. Next text. I wanted to show you, just give you, just whet your appetite a little bit. Just a few um, examples from the Old and then from the New Testament of these tangible, historically verifiable realities of God's Word. Here we have a 23-foot wall discovered by the archaeologist from 1967 onward in the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem. And this is part of the wall that was built by King Hezekiah in the 8th century B.C., 28 centuries ago. And the Bible talks about this wall. Let's take a look at the passage. It says in Isaiah 22, you saw that the breaches in the wall of the city of David were many. So you brought water into the city of Jerusalem and you, when you're there, can walk through Hezekiah's tunnel, the very thing that Isaiah is talking about here. And you counted the houses of Jerusalem. You tore down houses to fortify the wall. Underneath that wall, sticking out on either side, you can see the foundations, uh, uh, stones of um, uh, houses and can even see the different compartments, the different rooms in those houses where those were broken down. The wall was built over top of those homes, even using the same stones that, were, that, that comprised that home to make this new wall to keep the Assyrians out and to keep the people of Jerusalem inside safe from the Assyrian invasion. That's just, it's, it's reality right there in front of you. You see Isaiah 22, you look at that wall from Hezekiah's time, you look down and you see the foundations and you go, oh wow, he wasn't just kind of like eating too much pepperoni pizza the night before and had some weird dream. This is not just some kind of goofy flight of fancy on the part of the prophet. He is describing verifiable, tangible, archeologically discovered historical reality. You tore down the walls and you made a big, uh, their houses and you made a big wall with it. There it is. 
it's like, okay, well, you know what? I don't even need to, to, to have faith to, to recognize that because I see it. This is the land where faith becomes sight. I see it. It's tangible reality. Okay, so then what is the point of that for faith? It's God's word can be trusted. Yeah, on this little tiny out of the way, you know, detail tucked away in Isaiah 22, you've got all of this stuff then where you can like, it's almost like a video that you can see from 28 centuries ago, yeah? It's like something off of Star Wars. You can see the reality and then you can read it about, read about it in your Bible and it informs you that the God of the Bible is a God of history, a God of evidence. And that's the nature of biblical faith. Faith trust in God who verifies his trustworthiness in the past that then informs your faith for today and tomorrow. Next. Uh, at the, um, uh, in the old city of Jerusalem, this is the oldest part, it's called the city of David. Uh, and then next slide, we see that here in, in this red, uh, uh, circled by the red uh, mark, there's a, an archaeological excavation going on there. I think Pastor Weaver actually experienced some of it happening in real time in 2016. Uh, there was a re-excavation by Elat Mazar there. And what was discovered in this newest excavation of that area, here you see the Temple Mount, by the way, and the Dome of the Rock, Moscow El Aqsa, and New Jerusalem, uh, the newer part of the city here. Um, You've, they found this cache of, next slide, of um, seals made of clay that are used kind of like what we do when we lick an envelope and close it, you know? It seals a document closed, and the seal is of different people. Their signet ring making an impression on that wet clay so that when it dries, then it is, this is something that belongs to this particular person and they're sending it to that person and it keeps it protected from just anybody opening up and looking in. The book of Revelation, who is the one? There's only one that's worthy to break the seal and unroll the scroll. Do you remember this text? And so that you're, you're seeing that kind of biblical reality right in front of you. Dozens and dozens of these because this was evidently an administrative center of the palace area, the royal area. Next, uh, uh, next slide. This is an artist recreation of that. You see the scroll rolled up. You see the cords binding it closed. And then the seal that is impressed through the cord and onto the document and when it dries it forms uh, a perfect seal. Well one of these seals, next slide, one of these seals it, uh, has Hebrew writing on the top and on the bottom and has a very interesting um, uh, uh, image right here. It's of the sun's rays but it's winged. That's Egyptian art. You see this in Egypt and it also has the unk on either side. Here, the Egyptian symbol of the, the, the winged sun disk and the unk. Now the Hebrew here says, next, next slide, uh, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, the king of Judah. Well, all of a sudden now we have historically verifiable evidence in an area of the royal palace that there was a guy, like the Bible says in, first, in Second Kings and Second Chronicles and the book of Isaiah, and his name was Hezekiah, and his father was Ahaz, a previous king of the dynasty of David, and that this Hezekiah was the king of a kingdom whose name was Judah, because by this point Israel had split into two nations, the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. So for, for, for one uh, archaeological artifact, we have about four or five points of historical verification of material that's in the Bible. I mean, this kind of specificity does not exist in any other faith, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just telling you. I mean, this is something that you could only dream of in your wild imagination, wildest of imaginations that we would have in our possession and that when you go to Israel, you're in the Israel Museum, you're standing literally one foot from this, um, this uh, royal seal impression, looking at it through a piece of glass. Absolutely fantastic. What are the odds that we would have that? All of this verification. Hezekiah, Ahaz, Kingdom Judah. Neat stuff. And, and the archaeologists weren't even finished. 
about nine feet, nine or ten feet from where that one was discovered. Continue on. And by the way, that made the cover of the most um, uh, influential archaeology magazine, which you should probably be su subscribing to, to keep up with the rapidity of discoveries that are happening every year, every digging season in the land of the Bible. Constantly new stuff coming out of the ground, and you can keep up with it with a subscription to Biblical Archaeology Review. There you have the Hezekiah seal impression. Next text. Okay. About nine or ten feet from that, which makes perfect sense, because this is where all these used up seal impressions were evidently dumped out and discarded, was another one. And it says on there, belonging to Isaiah the prophet. Sixty-six chapters, a whole book in our Bible by the prophet Isaiah. And guess what? There is this archaeological relationship three steps from, watch this, one, two, three. That far from Hezekiah's seal impression found to where Isaiah's seal impression was found. Nine or ten feet removed from one another. And when you look in the Bible, Hezekiah and Isaiah are constantly interacting with one another. Isaiah was the court prophet of King Hezekiah, who was a godly king of the southern kingdom. Unbelievable. Who would have ever dreamed that we had this kind of information? Isaiah the prophet, Hezekiah the son of Ahaz, the king of Judah. Absolutely amazing. Next text. Just to balance it out again, we have an example from the New Testament. The New Testament. In 2006, there was a uh, property that was purchased right on the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee, the northwestern shore specifically. Our groups at uh, New Hope, we go to this location. The name of this city is Magdala. You know somebody famous who was from there. Mary Magdalene. Okay, so this is Magdala. This is the synagogue of Magdala. And if you'll notice that around the edges here are benches this is the synagogue, benches around the edges, and then another set of seats on the in, in, inside. Uh, benches around the edges, and then another set of seats closer to this rock pulpit that was found, or piece of a pulpit, where probably, as in Matthew 4, we're told that Jesus preached in every synagogue in Galilee, and this is in Galilee, and it's a synagogue, and it's a first century synagogue. More than likely, Jesus preached from that stone pulpit and read the scriptures like he did in Luke 4 from that stone pulpit. Um, we're now standing in the middle of a first century reality, a synagogue where Mary Magdalene grew up, where Jesus read the scriptures and preached and taught. And, but we're also having an opportunity to learn exactly what it is that Jesus meant in one of his sayings. Let's take a look at the uh, next slide. Jesus said this when he was rebuking the religious leaders. He says, you guys love the place of honor at banquets and then in parallel position, meaning he's saying kind of this, making the same point, and the chief seats in the synagogues. That's exactly what he's talking about there, those, that inner circle that's closest to the Torah scrolls and the authoritative teacher and all the, uh, the special stuff that goes on in a service. It's kind of like the, they get the box seats instead of sitting up in the grandstands, up in the cheap seats at the top, right? That makes sense? And so now again, faith has become sight. You see this text and you go, okay, well, whatever that means, I'm not sure. You know, that could you just be kind of like make-believe or whatever? But Jesus is referring to something that's tangible, physical reality in his world. And the people who first heard him, they understood exactly what he meant. But guess what? Now you understand exactly what he meant. Because for you, faith just became sight. Do you see how this works? How cool is that? Now, I want you to just take a second, and my time is over. I want, to take, I want you to take a second with me to pray and ask God to just really grind these realities into your heart, into your life, to, to, to help you, to let the, ask the Spirit to help you grind into to you this reality that I am living a current faith but it is based on the realities, the verifiable historical realities of the past 
And that is then informing me in my hope for the future so that whenever I go to prayer next time, I'm taking that kind of trust in God. God, I know this is not just some divine gamble game, but that I'm trusting in a God who's real, who's trustworthy, who is, is verified truth. Let's pray. Father, we want to give you thanks for this time that we've spent together. I ask that by your spirit, you do what I can't do, what my words can't do, and that is to grind in and make real and, and to attach, to find hooks, to put all of this stuff on, Lord, so that this becomes a part of the warp and woof of each person, each man, woman, and child's faith, trust in you, their relationship with you, their prayer life, their devotion, and uh, to, uh, their their commitment to you that we don't are not just a people who believe in pie in the sky by and by but that we serve a God who has gone out of his way to give us many 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 touch points with reality that we have evidence for what we believe and we can go forward from faith to faith with that and it's in Jesus awesome name we ask amen Amen. God bless you, New Hope.